Block share. This can be challenging. I will try to explain this to the best of my ability. We will first discuss the concept of block share, then learn how to calculate the block shear strength in steel members. Let's begin. Till now, we have been discussing greatly about yielding of cross section and rupture of net section. There is also a third type of failure that can arise in steel members under tension and it's block shear. We only used the yielding and rupture phenomena while solving for design tensile strength earlier, right? But there might be cases where the block shear strength controls and that strength is less than yielding strength or rupture strength. So we need to account for block shear while computing the design tensile strength. Let's learn what block shear is. Before we learn what block shear is, let's revise gross area yielding and net area rupture. We will start with gross area yielding. Imagine a plate without holes that is subjected to a tension force as shown. Now, if you take any random section in the plate, you will notice pure tension force throughout the width of the plate. The green arrows are the tensile stress occurring on that section. If the force keeps on increasing, you will see necking in the section before it fails at its tensile stress. We learned about this in part one of the course when we discussed about the stress strain behavior of steel. If you did not enroll for part one, not to worry, just browse lecture 1.7 in part one of my course. It's a preview lecture, so you will be able to view it anyways. We observe that each element of this section was in tension before it fractured. Hence, you can say that gross area yielding is a pure tension failure. Next, we will discuss about net area rupture. We have a plate with two holes subjected to a tension force. We all know that this is the fracture plane of the plate as it has the least steel area thanks to the bolt holes. In this case too, you will observe tension stresses on the section except for where the holes are punched. If you notice, I haven't shown any green arrows at the location of holes because there is no steel to take the stress. Although the stress distribution here is not uniform, you can see that the stresses are in tension throughout the plate. Well, if you increase the tension force high enough, the plate would rupture in this manner. So we concluded that in this case, all the elements were in tension just before the rupture of the section. This is a classic example. You can see the failure here occurred on the weakest section of the plate. Hence, net area rupture is a pure tension failure. From the two cases we discussed, you can say that the fracture planes were perpendicular to the line of force and the mode of failure was pure tension. Now comes the interesting part. Let's visualize block shear failure in a section. Imagine the same plate in tension. So till now we have learned that the net section or the failure plane was always perpendicular to the line of force. But that is not the case every time. Look at the potential fracture plane here. You can see a vertical plane and a horizontal plane. As discussed for planes that are perpendicular to the line of force, indicated by green arrows, they are under pure tension. But the horizontal plane that runs parallel to the line of force will undergo shear. You can imagine that the steel around the horizontal plane will move against each other in the opposite direction, developing a shear stress between them, shown by blue arrows. If I keep increasing the tensile force, the plate will fracture in this manner. The vertical plane or the plane that is perpendicular to the line of force undergoes tension, shown by green arrows. And the horizontal plane or the plane that is parallel to the line of force undergoes shear, shown by blue arrows. 
the block of plate just comes apart and there is a tear in the plate. So there are two kinds of stresses acting here, tension and shear. This phenomenon where the rupture of steel takes place due to tension and shear force combined and results in a fracture of the block of steel is called block shear. The term block refers to the part of the plate that is chipping out and shear refers to the additional stresses in the plate apart from tension. Hence, this type of fracture is called block shear. Look at this image. You can see a block of steel chipped out from the plate because of shear stresses in, in addition to tensile stresses. You may ask, what causes this type of failure? Well, as you can see in the image, the bolts are spaced much closer and the edge distance, that is the distance from the outermost bolt to the edge of the plate, is very less. Members where adequate bolt spacing and edge distances are not maintained are at a very high risk of failing under block shear. So, while calculating the tensile strength of a member with holes, it is necessary to check for block shear. Hence, block shear is a combined tension and shear failure. I hope it made sense. Now, there is one more way this could have fractured under block shear. This type of a failure occurs when the bolts are spaced closely together, but there is sufficient edge distance. So the edges of the plate did not fracture, but only the part of the steel between the two bolts fractured. The green arrows represent the tensile stresses and blue arrows represent shear stresses. Well, now that we have learned what is block shear, let us now dive deeper into the concept. I hope everything is clear till now. Please watch the rest of the video only if first half is clear. If not, mention it in the Q&A. I will try my best to solve your doubts. Okay. So now we will see how to compute the block shear strength of a member. For that, first we need to understand the force distribution in the member that is failing due to block shear. This is an angle section in plan view. Now I have punched five holes in a single row. Now I apply a tension force on the angle. Well, as discussed earlier, this would be the potential fracture plane for block shear as shown in yellow. We saw earlier that the plane parallel to the line of force undergoes shear. Hence that plane is called a shear plane. And the plane that is perpendicular to this line of action undergoes tension. Hence that plane is called a tension plane. Here you can notice that the shear plane is much greater in length than the tension plane. It means that there is more steel to support the shear than tension. Hence, in this situation, the tension plane is the weaker plane and the shear plane is a stronger plane. Every section will have a strong and a weak plane according to its dimension and hole locations. I hope it's clear. Now that you know what are shear and tension planes, let's discuss how the stresses are distributed between them. This is the same angle section we discussed a few moments ago. We have realized that the tension plane is the weaker plane and shear plane is the stronger plane. I have assumed their shear and tensile strengths. These are just random numbers. The shear strength is assumed at 200 kips and tensile strength is assumed at 100 kips. Tensile strength is much lower because as we concluded, that tension plane is the weaker plane. Okay, so now imagine a tensile force PU acting on the angle section. It starts from zero and we will gradually increase the force. There will be no change in the section if the tensile force is kept below 100 kips. But if I increase the tension force beyond 100 kips, but below 200 kips, the tension plane starts to yield because the force has now exceeded the tensile strength of the plane, right? 
but the member does not fail yet as the tensile plane is connected with the shear plane which has a much higher strength the shear plane will keep the section intact but will allow the steel to yield in tension i hope you are able to imagine this the steel is kept intact because of the yielding strength in tension and the fracture strength from the shear plane so we can say that the total strength of the connection is the combination of the yielding strength in weaker plane and the fracture strength in the stronger plane we will use this concept to calculate the block shear strength of the member now if the force exceeds 200 kips there is a failure in the shear plane as well now that both the planes have fractured the element fails in block shear i hope it is clear in this example section i have arranged the bolts such that the shear plane is the stronger plane but there may also be cases where the tensile plane is stronger plane in those situations the shear plane would yield first before the tensile plane fractures going forward we will use this concept to compute for block shear strength so we saw how this equation was derived now next question you might have is how do we know that which plane is the stronger plane and which one is the weaker well there are two possibilities right first a strong tension plane and a weak shear plane and second a weak tension plane and a strong shear plane well aisc answers this question by asking us to solve for both the conditions and then determining the governing condition so you have to calculate the block shear strength of both the possibilities and the smaller value will be the block shear strength this is the first equation the green text refers to tension plane and blue text refers to shear plane it reads the tensile fracture strength on the net section in one direction plus shear yield strength on the gross area on the perpendicular direction observe the text in upper case it reads tensile fracture and shear yield that means that the tension plane is the stronger plane and shear plane is the weaker plane because the shear has yielded but it was the tensile fracture that led to block shear failure we know tension plane is the stronger plane the next equation reads shear fracture on the cross section in one direction plus tensile yield strength on the net area on the perpendicular direction tension plane yields and the shear plane fractures that means the block shear has occurred after the shear plane has fractured so shear plane is the stronger plane and tensile plane is the weaker plane after computing for the block shear strength the minimum of both the conditions is the governing block shear strength of the section aisc gives us an equation to do just that it may seem a long equation but it is much simpler than it looks the terms on the left and right of the inequality sign are the two conditions discussed above the term with a factor of 0.6 is the shear strength term some of you would ask why 0.6 well because after numerous experiments it has been seen that the shear fracture strength of the member is about 60% of its maximum tensile strength hence the 0.6 factor let's see what these terms are rn is the nominal block shear strength fu as you already know is the ultimate tensile stress ANV is the net area of steel in shear. We already know that AN is the net area and V stands for shear. So ANV is the net area of steel in shear. UBS is a reduction factor. We will discuss this in a bit. ANT is the net area of steel in tension. T here stands for tension. 
FY we already know is the minimum yield strength of steel and AGV is the gross area of steel in shear. Let's talk about reduction factor UBS. It is used to account whether the stress distribution is uniform or not on the tensile plane. If the stress distribution is uniform, UBS equals 1. And if the stress distribution is non-uniform, then UBS equals to 0.5. You may ask, how does one know if the stress distribution is uniform or not? Well, AISC gives us a certain guidelines for that. Let's have a look. For angles, gusset plates and coped beams with one line of pole, these are coped beams. With one line of poles, UBS is equal to 1. This covers majority of the possibilities. But if we have coped beams with two rows of poles, the stress distribution is not uniform because the row of poles towards the end of the beam takes a larger proportion of shear load than the one further away from it. We will now solve three examples which will clear out our understanding about block shear. See you there.